The first screenplay I sold was uh, Beetlejuice. That was the first one, and when it was finished, I had a very good relationship with a very prominent studio head who shall remain nameless. Uh, and, I, and when Beetlejuice was finished, I gave it to him to read on a Friday. And he said, I'm happy to read it. And I got a call on a Monday that he wanted to meet with me. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, he read it. He must love it or he would not be summoning me to his office so quickly. And I went into his office and he said to me, Larry, what are you doing? He said, you have a, actually a very good future as an, as, as, as an executive, as a producer. This piece of crap is going to sink you and sink your career. Why would you put this on the marketplace representing you? And uh, he said, it's weird. It makes no sense. It's not commercial. And um, I left that meeting, <laughs> as you can imagine, uh, 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 to, say, to say a little taken aback, a little, uh, uh, we would be putting it mildly. He could not understand why I would want this bizarre piece of junk uh, representing me. Uh, uh, and, uh, but I had also given it to, because I've taught for like 25, 30 years, primarily at UCLA, and I was teaching a story analysis class at that time, and I had a student named Marjorie Lewis, and uh, I thought she was the smartest young woman in my class, and she had a low-level um, uh, development job at the Geffen Company, and I'd given it her, to her to read, only to see what she thought because I really had learned to value her opinion. And so coming out of this meeting, uh, uh, feeling very bad about myself, uh, I called Marjorie and I said, did you read it? And she said, yes, I read it. And I said, did you like it? And she said, like it, I'm gonna get the Geffen Company to buy it. And, uh, as, and knowing Marjorie, what she did was that she just put it on people's desks and she was so tenacious and she was so annoying that people just finally said, okay, we'll read it, we'll read it. And, uh, and uh, that's how it got to the Geffen Company and that's how it got read. And Marjorie is, uh, probably, like I say, probably one of two unsung heroes of that film. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, the Geffen Company uh, proceeded to buy it. Um, for our asking price, oh my God, which was incredible, and then on it went. When I went to work for Walter Hill, I left Paramount, and I went to work for Walter Hill uh, uh, and the Phoenix Company, and, and Walter was one of the producers of Alien, the first Alien film, and, uh, and his partner and, and my, my two bosses, David Geiler, was another one of the producers. And when I went to work for them, uh, the, one of the first things they said to me, uh, one of the primary things that your job is going to be is to find us a writer for the Alien sequel. And I, uh, and I uh, without going into detail, certain promises were made to me if I found that writer good things would happen. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. Um, and uh, I met with Jim Cameron. And uh, th th this, th this is, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say I discovered Jim Cameron for Aliens and that's pretty true. But if you had my job and Jim, and this was, I, I believe that uh, Terminator was Maybe in pre-production or post, it's, it's long enough, I don't remember, but uh, Terminator was, was not out there. But if you uh, read the script of Terminator and met Jim Cameron and you didn't think that he was going to be the Jim Cameron, you didn't deserve my job. Uh, so this was, this was hardly like uh, a, 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 a great insight on my part. You just met, met Jim and he was a force of nature and you could just feel the talent. 
Uh, but it still was a hard sell because he had a he had a, a not very good movie called Piranha 2 uh, that that you know that I had to show people and this was back in the day when you had to set up a projector and you know in an office and and and, and hope all the light wasn't bleeding and and but I just I, but anyway there, it was it was a bit of a struggle it was a bit of a fight. Uh, but Jim not only became the writer, obviously, but the director of Aliens. And I went to my bosses and said, okay, I think I did my job. I think I not only uh, brought the writer to the project, I brought the director to the project, look what I did. And they said, yes, you did, so what? Uh, and it was enough. I, I just felt, uh, and I'd had an experience at Paramount with a film called Young Sherlock Holmes, which was an original idea of mine and as an executive there we were under so much pressure to bring in ideas that I did something I told myself I was never going to do because I sort of had a little file of ideas that one day if I write again I'm going to write and that was one of them and I brought that in and there were a lot of promises made to me if that got made great things would happen and it did get made uh, uh, written by Chris Columbus uh, um, uh, and I, I just, I, I just realized, and, and also I just, I, I was a writer. I mean, that's who I was. And I'd let that go. And I had allowed myself to suffer a classic case of writer's block. And, uh, and I just said, I'm going to be a writer again. And I got, I got very blessed having my partner, Michael McDowell, who was as professional a writer as I'd ever come across and working with him, uh, inspired me, challenged me, uh, uh, made me understand what it m truly meant to be a writer and a screenwriter and a screenwriter with a career. And, I, and, 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 when, when, and, and the, the epiphany was actually, I don't wanna, I, 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 I wanna be a writer again and I, I'm just kind of selling myself short and selling my talent short by not doing it and get over the fear and, and do it. Maybe this is a good story uh, for aspiring screenwriters out there. Uh, when, I, when I went to work with, with uh, Michael McDowell on Beetlejuice, uh, we had been working for a couple of weeks and he sat down with me and he said, Larry, this is not working out. This is not happening. And I was taken aback and I said, why? What do you mean? He said, because you're just sitting around waiting for inspiration. And I don't work like that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to sit around waiting for, for you to be inspired. If you're going to work with me, and Michael was as professional writer as I had ever met. He had published, I don't know, 19, 20 novels, horror novels, genre, genre, great genre novels. He had written for a show called Tales from the Dark Side. He was the real deal. And, 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 and not, a, not, a, not, a per, not, not a person to, to hold back his feelings, <laughs> okay? Um, and, he, and, he, and again, he said to me, this is just not happening. And he, and he said, and this, this was the most, this changed my, my life as a writer. He said, if you're gonna work with me, look at it like we're working in a bank. We get in at nine, we have a cup of coffee, we say good morning, we, we, then we go to work. And we, work. and we write until lunch, we go have our lunch, we come back, we write again until around three o'clock in the afternoon, we fold up the writing, we return whatever phone calls, whatever business of writing we have to do, and we do this five, six days a week. And, we're, and, and, and it's a job. It's, it's, it's not you sitting in a, with a metaphorical beret in a metaphorical loft waiting for inspiration to strike. It's a job. And it was a bit of tough love and it took me aback. Uh, uh, and and I was, I, I suppose, a tiny bit offended. But then, then the thing he said to me that sealed the deal, because I, when I was working at Paramount, I was writing script notes. Again, it was, it was like a 16-hour day often. And, and probably 14 of those hours a day was writing script notes. And he said, Larry, you've told me you've written hundreds of pages of notes for other people's scripts. Why can't you do it for yourself?
and I was like, wow, okay, I will try it your way. And it changed my perception of who a writer is, what a writer does, and it changed my work habits and it changed uh, everything. And I did it his way, and I took all of that, all, all, and he was absolutely right. All of that discipline that I'd put into other people's work, I put in. I, I started putting into my work, our work, and 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 it was. It, it, and and Beetlejuice came out of that. And as crazy and you know, and as far out as that movie is, the script was written in a very disciplined way, because that was the way Michael needed to work. When I decided I was going to be a writer again and decided I was going to do it with Michael, in my mind I said to myself, that oh, sounds so awful maybe, but I'm going to write a classic. Oh. I'm not just going to write another movie. We are going to create a classic. And who knows what that means. And again, it sounds obnoxious maybe, but um, uh, we knew probably I don't know, 20 some pages in, that just something was happening. And we weren't thinking about demographics, we weren't thinking about who the audience was gonna be, we weren't thinking about any, any quote unquote commercial uh, 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 aspects of it. We were thinking what's good, what's funny, what's making us laugh, what's moving the story forward, what are the zaniest, craziest ideas we can have? And it just, it, and, and it, it happens with, with, with scripts, and, and it happens in your writing. There's just times that you feel that you're in a zone and you're in a place that you're so connecting with yourself and you're so connecting with what your vision is that if you can get it on a page, other people are gonna see it and feel it too. And that movie was, was that. And uh, we didn't know what was gonna happen with it. Uh, when, when the movie was finished, there were people at Warner Brothers in the marketing department who absolutely hated it. They wanted to change the title to House Ghost and dump it. And back in the days when you'd put it in a thousand theaters or something and let it run a week and then hopefully it would go away. That wasn't everyone. And we had David Geffen on our side, so we were protected. But it was hardly loved. Uh, uh, but um, I knew who we were writing it for. And, uh, and in my mind, uh, and uh, this is a very 80s reference, there was a band, uh, there, there was still a band, The Cure, The Great Cure, uh, a band I loved. Mm -hmm. And I had gone to see them at the Rose Bowl, huge concert, maybe 50,000 people. Nice. And it felt to me like it was 50,000 teenage girls in black. <laughs> right. I was probably yeah, them, you know, yeah. right, I you know. Curious, yeah. And 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 that was and 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 the when an erotic character Lydia came out of that, and I always thought thought that's who the audience for this movie is. And as we were writing it, and, and, and I, 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 that for me, and it may have been different for Michael, but that was always who I thought this movie was being written for. And, and it's really a family story, and it's about a, a girl who needs a mom and a dad, and, 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 and because her real mom and dad just don't understand her, don't spend enough time with her, so she ends up with two ghosts. That's the heart of that movie, and that's what I was writing towards. And the most, and, and so, so finally it's, it's released, and I go to see it uh, uh, nearby where we're sitting now at Universal uh, on a Friday night, it's the first Friday night, and I watch it with an audience, a real audience for the first time. Of course, there have been some test audiences and all of that. And people are coming out of it either loving it or hating it, which I thought, great. That's exactly what we wanted. And that was, that was Friday night. Then Saturday night, I went back and I saw a bunch of teenage girls who had gone into their closet 
having seen it on Friday night and came back dressed like Winona Ryder, Lydia Dietz. And I thought, okay, it's a hit. We have connected with the audience to the point that they're already dressing up as Lydia. And then there was a marketing meeting at Warner Brothers. It may have been on the Monday. And it had surpassed everyone's expectations in terms of the grosses and, 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 and the, the, the audience feedback. And it was obvious that, the, that it was, that was going to take off and be something special. And again, in, in this no-name zone, there was... There, there, <laughs> That's what I was wondering about, Mr. There no was Name. A, there was yeah. a marketing person uh -huh. who I always remember as a guy who would wear a scarf no matter what the temperature was, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was... Uh, it, 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 I remember Tim Burton being there and David Geffen being there and the, the Michaels and myself. And this marketing person all he could say, all he could, the best he could do was, well, at least we got the little girls in black to come see it. And we walked out of the meeting and Tim said, well, who the F did we think he made it for? Yeah. <laughs> who did he think we made it for? And, and, and uh, it was just, it, it, and, and, and when, thing, when things are going well in my writing, and I, th I think it's true for all writers that if, if you're like intensely self-conscious about who is your audience, who, who is it, you know, uh, is this for the 12 to 16 year old? You, if you're doing that, you're not writing well. And you get in a zone and your story starts telling you. You're not telling the story. It's emerging from someplace within you. And that's what Beetlejuice was. And I just always had to, and I used to say to Michael sometimes, because I could feel it going well, and I'd say, Michael, you know we're going to have a toy line. And he'd go, shut up, shut up. <laughs> just let's just finish the script, you know. <laughs> right. But I, I mean, it's, it's a very hard thing to explain what that, what that, what that it, 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 it's, a, it's an epiphany after an epiphany, and that you feel like you're just onto something bigger than you, you know. What that story is, and, and you know, it's not that cliche, write what you know, because I've never written what I quote unquote know. I, I write fantastical worlds and, 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 uh, and, and uh, supernatural s stories and all of that. But write what you feel and write what's in your heart and write something that means something to you. And you know, I, I, I was a script reader for, God, probably a decade. and, I, and uh, the, and, and I was reading seven, eight scripts a week. Uh, and the rare one was the great script. And when you found that, that was a very exciting day at the office. And sometimes the really terrible scripts were kind of, they were fun because they were so god awful. But the ones that, that got really exhausting and really enervating as a script reader who's sitting there and has to read a script, synopsize it, write a comment about it, then pick up another one and read it and synopsize, were the ones that you could tell were written by people who were looking at what last year's hit was and trying to imitate it. And uh, those were deadly. And they, were, they weren't good, they weren't bad, they were safe and mediocre, and any writer, any young writer, any old writer, anyone who's just starting to write anything, write something that you feel, right? Write, write, write something that comes from the heart. And, and, and people may not think that Beetlejuice is a personal movie. It's an intensely personal movie. It was intensely personal for Michael and me. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I didn't know I had a theme until I had enough work to realize I had a theme. And almost everything I've written are about broken families who are put back together in some bizarre way. But, there, but, but because I came from a broken family. And, 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 uh, what, and, and, and so, so the, 
there's a, I, I like to think that my work has a sense of heart and a sense of compassion and a sense of humanity in it, no matter how bizarre it is, no matter how weird the worlds get. Uh, uh, and and you, you, got, you got to write something that you feel and something that, that you have some passion for. Or just why do it? It's too hard. It's just, it's, it, 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 it's not an easy job. And, and I personally can't imagine saying, well, this was a hit. Now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write my version of that. I don't really, it's not really what I care about, what I feel, but I can imitate it well enough. I, I can't imagine spending a year of your life doing that, but people do it all the time. And they usually write mediocre scripts. There's an idea. And usually what I know is I know Beetlejuice, for instance, the idea was that I discussed with my partners a psychedelic ghost comedy. We had no idea what that meant, but it rolled off the tongue, right? And, 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 and I usually have something of an idea like that, and I kind of know the beginning, and I kind of know the end. The middle is the great unknown. But, 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 but it's, a, it's an instinct and an idea, and sometimes it's a character, and sometimes it's a situation. But it's very, it's very internal at first. And, and, and yes, there's times where you write on assignment, you know, and, and, and you're, you're, you're given an idea and say, translate this into a movie. But in terms of my, um, my, 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 own, my, my own writing, if you will, my, my, my personal writing, it usually comes from, from, from just uh, the most basic kind of idea and a feeling, you know, and, 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 and it's like, um, and I'm, I'm, I, I can't articulate it very well, I'm sorry, because it's hard to articulate. But it's just kind of like, a, again, like, like, like a situation or a character that's just kind of waiting to come out. And then you, whatever, you, what, whatever your process is, and boy, do you need a process, and boy, do you need to go to work, and boy, do you need to sit down and do it, and do the job of writing, and, and, and you allow that, that character or that situation to just start growing and start, start coming, you know, leaving your fingers onto the digital page these days, you know, onto your computer, and then it grows and expands and it takes on life. And, and uh, you know, I, there, there's, of course, and, and this, is, this is every writer's choice, uh, there's a lot of talk about backstory always, you know, like, like, tell it, you know, where did your character go to school? How, you know, what, what, what was his or her mommy like and all of that? I've never written a backstory in my life, never. But if you ask me to tell me the backstory of one of my characters, I could. I'd kind of be making it up as I went along, but the feelings would be true. Because I feel I, I, I feel the characters and I and, and, and I feel like they need to come out and I feel like they need to be given a voice and and that's just that that that's that's what writing is to me uh, um, an idea or a character or a situation or an emotion or a feeling um, that 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 you somehow have to put into the world. And it's hard to articulate, and I, and I feel like I'm talking in circles. But I, but it's, it, it just, it's almost hard not to because it's so, it, it's so ephemeral in the beginning. You know, I, I, I hope that makes some version of sense. I kind of know an ending, but that can all change. But uh, uh, people get very scared of the middle. But for me, that's when it gets fun because it's so challenging. And you so get to what, you know, in a screenplay, if you think of a screenplay as 110, 120 pages, you get to page 60 and you go, oh my God, <laughs> I'm only halfway there. What happens next? But 
but something will happen. And, and, I, I, and that's exhilarating, and it's exhilarating to go to bed completely sure that you will never figure out what's going to happen next and wake up with the answer. And that, and, 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 it, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a daily challenge, but it's, a, it's so, it, feel, it feels so good to realize that that next scene will be there if you keep working at it. There's, there's, it's the best feeling in the world other than finishing and then finishing. It's like the first draft, no matter what shape it's in, is like brilliant. I mean, that's just, I always uh, uh, get tears in my eyes when I finish a first draft because I feel like I'm saying goodbye to a group of people that I've been on this journey with. And, and, and there's, a, there, there's a very emotional side to it. And then, you know, then you become the craftsman and time for a second draft and all of that. But uh, it, it's, it's, an, it's an emotional journey. And, and to do that day after day, it's, it's incredibly rewarding. It's, I've got the best job in the world. I will go back. I will never go back to the beginning because that is a death trap. I know what I'll do. I'll go back and rewrite the first 60 pages. And then I'll go back and rewrite the first 60 pages again and again. I'll go back and read a couple of pages and, and, and maybe do some cosmetic stuff just to get, you know, to, just to put myself uh, it, it, back into the zone of the story. And then you just, and then I just start writing and they may not be good ideas. There may be, my, 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 my drafts are always 20, 30 pages too long. Uh, when, when I finish the first draft, because I'm telling the story to myself. Uh, but I, 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 I forget who it was. I'm going to say Oscar Wilde. I'm going to say some famous writer said, just sit down and start typing your name over and over. Maybe Oscar Wilde may have been pre-typewriter. But, but you understand the point. Start typing your name. Start doing anything with your fingers. And, I, and again, it's, it's like... Um, where that comes from and where that next scene comes from, it's there. It, it, it is there. Uh, and if you put yourself in a position to find it, you will find it. And I might spend a day writing 10 basically bad pages, but there'll be one page of truth in it and one, one moment that will move the story forward. And, and Stephen King talks about this really brilliantly. And uh, he, I have questions about outlining, and I'm not here to have an outline debate. He's scathing about outlining. If you've ever read his book on writing, um, great, probably the best book on writing ever written to my mind. But he always says it's what happens next. It's what happens next, what happens next, what happens next. And, you know, if I were to reach across the room here and, and steal your, pay, your, 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 your notes from you, <laughs> there would be a response. Yes. That, and, or if I were to kick the camera over and say, I'm done with this interview, <laughs> there would be a response, right? And then it's what happens next. <laughs> Do you jump on me and <laughs> say, give me my notes back, you jerk? Do you? I mean, and it's really that, it, it's kind of gets, it, it, and if you just look at it like that, 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 and, and, and you look at it like, like, like whatever, whatever you made happen, something has to happen next, and it's what happens next, what happens next, what happens next, what happens next, that what happens next will come, and it may not come easily, and there may be a lot of, like I said, bad what happens next before you write, find the right what happens next but it'll come and it's it and it's it, it, it it's a magical process i mean magical in the sense that that it, it, it's almost unexplainable uh and it's why it, and it's why there's so many uh, uh uh screenwriting programs and apps and 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 all of these things out there to kind of tell you that they can tell you what happens next 
but they can't tell you what happens next. Only you can tell you what happens next. And I look at it as a moment by moment process. And I put these characters in a situation and it's often diabolical and it's often otherworldly and they've got to get themselves either deeper into it or get the hell out of it. And that's the journey and, and it's moment by moment and, it's, and it's, it's sort of literally second by second if you think about it. You know, movies move forward in a linear fashion and it's just, and, and it's just tracking that and, 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 and putting your character, and, and when, when it really gets fun is when you put your character in the most difficult, uh, here can I tell you a quick anecdote that, 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 that is probably the, 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 uh, an illustration that I use about this all the time. When I teach the very first class, I always say, and I make the statistic up depending on how I'm feeling the room, uh, uh, I just, <laughs> I will say, ninety-eight percent of you will fail, and people go, oh! right. uh -huh. <laughs> and, and I say, you'll fail because you'll never finish. You will never finish your script, and and sad but true. I'm I'm not wrong. I'm 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 pretty darn close, and I've taught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students at this point, and not finishing is exactly what most people will do. I just have, I, I've just been teaching a workshop uh, where I've given people 12 weeks to finish a draft uh, uh, that they've been working on for a long time and the dropout rate is enormous. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what you said. This is perfectionism and this is not allowing yourself the ability to fail. And it's a huge mistake. Uh, you, you have to, you know, ba ba baseball metaphors get tossed around a lot uh, in, in the screenwriting trade because they kind of fit in a way. Like if you're batting 300, you're doing great, but that means you're hitting the ball once every three times, right? Um, and, and, uh, and, and, but to go back to this what happens next idea and how I, you know, and, and you, you had said, you wake up on Monday morning with your cup of coffee and you've gone to work and you have no idea what, what needs to happen next in your script. Well, a story I, I, t I tell about this uh, uh, almost always in my classes was uh, from Beetlejuice where uh, there, there, there's a scene that a lot of people love actually. It's, it's, it's become like a lot of people, one of their favorite scenes. And uh, the ghost, Barbara, uh, Barbara and Adam, Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin, they've died, they've driven off a bridge, uh, trying to avoid a dog, aren't they good people? They tried to avoid the doggy and they've driven off a bridge and they've drowned. And they're trapped in their house now as ghosts. And they've been given a book about how to, how, the handbook for the recently deceased that they can't make, that they can't figure it out. And they want to go into the afterlife and ask questions about how to be ghosts and how they're supposed to live, you know, live as ghosts, die as ghosts, whatever. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but what Michael, my, my writing partner, Michael McDowell and I had done is uh, we had trapped them so well in their house, we had no idea how to get them into the afterlife. We had done a very good job of sticking them there what, with what felt like no exit. And we had to come up with a way for them to get out of the house. And uh, the dynamic between, the, you, you, got, you got to understand, Michael was, I'm going to say Harvard educated, if not Harvard, some incredibly prestigious university. Uh, I, I grew up in a trailer park and barely got out of high school, okay? <laughs> there was, there, there, there was, there, there was a, 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 sometimes it, it was usually, usually playful, but sort of a status issue between us. And, and, and the way we'd often work is that I would like vomit out ideas and he would just start shooting them down. And it was always one word, no, no, no. <laughs> No, and we were trying to come up with a way to get them out of the house. Barbara and Adam, the ghosts, get them into the afterlife. And I was coming up with more and more convoluted ideas about how to get them out of the house. And I'm sure trying to bring out my supernatural chops and all that I knew about, you know, metaphysics and blah, 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 just to get them out of the house. And every idea I came up with, no, 
no, no, and my ideas kept getting further and further out and more convoluted, no, no, no. And I finally got really angry with Michael. And I said, Michael, what do you want them to do? Draw an effing door? And I just said it because I thought it was the stupidest idea imaginable. And I was so mad. I said, is that what you want? You want them to draw a door? And he just started laughing. And I started laughing and we said, yes. That's exactly what they should do is draw a door. So rather than these incredibly like this convoluted supernatural nonsense, Adam found a piece of chalk, drew a door, drew a doorknob, opened it and went into the afterlife. Simple. But it took all of that convoluted stuff to get there. And that's what will happen when you sit down and you're stuck. You will write and write and write and you won't think you found it, and, and you'll know you haven't found it. But if you keep at it and you'll keep writing, there'll finally be that epiphanal moment where you'll go, oh, that's what happens next. And then you will write that and you will have moved your characters forward one more step in your story. And then the next what happens next is in front of your eyes and you move forward like that. And it's sometimes it's literally moving an inch or less than an inch at a time. And sometimes it's running, sometimes it's crawling, sometimes the what happens next happen really quickly and, and, and you have a day where you just go, oh my God, you know, I just, I just, you know, I just wrote 10 great pages and all they need is just a little, a little sprucing up and they're there and some days you will write 10 pages and you will have maybe a quarter of a page that's usable but you will have moved the story forward that much. And it's, it, it, it's a kind of alchemy, a kind of a, a, a magic of creation, but it's such a beautiful feeling. It's the best job in the world. One thing that I, that I, I love doing uh, when I'm doing workshops uh, is having like a free write. And I will pick something, a, a topic, something that's happened to me that week or, 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 or something that's, that's either like making me really happy or really bothering me. It can be in the world, it can be personal and all of that. And I will ask people to write. Just like let's spend the first half hour of the class just writing about that. And, and that could be I was on the phone yesterday and before I knew it I was saying things that I really regret and I couldn't take back. Have you, have you been on the phone and said things to someone who you really care about that you really regret and, uh, and, and you can't take back? And of course everyone has. Uh, and people will write and because again I, I, I will be sort of ruthlessly honest with myself. It'll give p people permission to be honest with themselves. And, um, and, and some of the most amazing writing I've had come out of my workshops are those free writes. Uh, and, 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 it's, and it's writing there's going to be so much rejection. There's going to be so much uh, um, uh, indifference. There's going to be there, there, there's going to be so uh, so many people saying, "No, other people do that. You don't do that. You, that uh, no, other people make movies. You don't make movies." Uh, uh, I, I, I was I was with a very talented writer director on on Sunday night, who was from Georgia and was talking about when he said to his family he was moving to New York to make movies, he said, I, I might as well have been saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Mars to colonize the red planet. You know, I mean, no, that's, other people do that. A kid from Georgia doesn't do that. And, and I just try to convince people that, the, that, that to just relax. Oh my God, relax, just write it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, some people will hate it. Some people will love it. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice got a lot of terrible reviews. Uh, 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 they were wrong. Uh, I, I, I was told by one of the most prominent executives in Hollywood, I was ruining my career. He was wrong. 
uh, uh, people, but what, what, so what if they're right? You'll write another one. And, 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 I, and I love doing free writes. I love saying, reveal a little something about yourself. This is a safe place. And it's amazing what comes out uh, if, if people give themselves permission to do that. But it's hardly a perfect process. And, and so many people will be so afraid of how they're going to be judged by their words on a, on, on a computer screen, for God's sakes. It's a screenplay, okay? It's a effing screenplay. Get over it, you know? I mean, but they will be so afraid of how they're going to be judged and how they're going to be judged a failure that they'll just quit and they'll figure out something else to do. So I try, I try, and I try to just loosen people up and say, feel, feel free to fail. I started surfing again. Uh, a couple of years ago after, after uh, 40 years of not doing it. And I was a really good surfer 40 years ago. And I started again and I was terrible. I mean, I just, everything I thought I knew, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, I knew it in principle, but I had to learn again. Uh, and then all of a sudden I started getting good again. But it was after a lot of falling off a surfboard and embarrassing myself. Uh, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's that, it's that same thing. You fall off, you fall off, you fall off, and then you don't. And that's, and, and writing is you're going to write badly, you're going to write badly, and then you're going to write good. When I became a, a studio executive at Paramount, um, working most closely with Jeff Katzenberg, um, it was all of a sudden there was this, uh, th this, as these bizarre trends happen and you don't quite understand uh, where they come from and then why they go away, but all of a sudden it became very important to hire uh, people in development positions who had a Harvard education. And um, I was working with a couple of them. And, uh, and, and they also went to the school of Machiavelli, I guess, and, and uh, <laughs> had read and reread The Art of War. And, 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 and on, on strategically on that level, they could kill me dead, okay? But I thought about it, and I thought, I've loved movies since I, I can remember. And while I was terrible in school, I was a terrible student. My mom loved reading and she taught me a love of reading. So I had that on my side. But what I really had on my side was if I loved a movie, I loved a movie. I loved it. And, and if I, and, and I realized pretty quickly that the movies, the movie business, it was not a, 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 a business meant for Harvard grads. And I could read a script and say, this is a movie, and say it with as much confidence as possible and, 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 and mean it and believe it. And, uh, I, and, but I was up against this, I, this, this and, and my own inferiority complex sometimes about not having been a good student and not having you know, barely gotten out of high school. It would work on me sometimes. But one day after I'd been co completely creamed in, 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 a, in a development war with, with one of these Harvard grads, uh, Jeff Katzenberg took me aside and he said, Larry, you need to learn to be a straight player in a crooked game. Mm -hmm. I'm not here for you to out manipulate anyone. You're sitting with me and you have, and, and you're sitting beside me here because when you love something, you love it. And when you read a script and you love it, you're going to make sure that you, that, that, that everyone else loves it too. And, 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 and that's what I like in you. And that's why you're valuable to me. Stop trying to be a studio executive. Be a guy who can read a script or watch a movie and, and get excited the way you get excited. Mm -hmm. And that, that was uh, uh, a, 
a huge shot in the arm of confidence that I that I took away, and uh, I, I I owe Jeff Katzenberg gratitude for a lot of things that he wouldn't even be aware of, but that was a big one because he told me just be yourself and use this passion for movies and this love for movies and make that your calling card. Don't try to be uh, a, a, a player. You're not good at it. You're horrible at it, <laughs> which I am because I wear everything on my sleeve. Ask my wife. Yeah. <laughs>
uh, th those are those things. Don't, don't trick yourself. Just go in and tell the best story that you can. You write a really, really good screenplay and the metaphysics of getting a meeting after that are so elusive. Sorry, uh, I, I, I'm not, I, and, and it's a very sincere question and, I, and I, 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 it gets asked to me uh, all the time. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm go so I'm going to dance around it a little bit, but I'm going to, but uh, again, uh, not seriously, but sincerely. Um, there was a time when I was teaching, and uh, that here's something about me, uh, me as a teacher. I am a, I, I, I am a screenwriting teacher who's not a failed screenwriter. I'm actually a successful screenwriter who teaches at the same time. Uh, oh God, that was cheap. Uh, I apologize. Uh, uh, but um, I, 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 stopped, I stopped teaching at one point because I really had an ethical dilemma. Because I thought the real reason people were taking my classes is to say to me, how do you get a movie made? You've gotten movies made. You've gotten through the door. How do I get through the door? And I could have been teaching anything. I could be teaching story analysis, screenplay structure, dialogue, anything. And I thought the real reason that people were there was to ask me, Larry Wilson, how do I get a pitch meeting? How do I get a movie made? How do I get through the door? And I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. And I felt like I was like part of this false hope machine. And I didn't like it, and I didn't like the way it made me feel. And I stopped teaching. And the thing that brought me back to teaching, and where I could do it again, where a question like that, which I wish I had a great answer. I, 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 look, I've, I, I've been blessed uh, by the fact that doors open, unexpected doors open for me my entire life after I moved to Hollywood. I was working in a department store stocking makeup uh, because, I'd because I'd cleaned my mother's beauty shop for years and I knew how to stock makeup. And the woman who loved the way I stocked her makeup said, oh, so you want to be in like the, the entertainment business? Well, you should do cue cards. And she introduced me to a man named Barney McNulty. And the next thing I knew was I was doing cue cards on all the biggest television shows of the time. A door opened. I can't explain why that happened, why I went in stocking makeup and that door opened. Luck and all of that, it's too complex of a question. But, and, but I knew it was what people were asking. I hope this is making sense. I, I knew it was what people were asking me, really. How do I get through the door? How do, how do I get my script read by someone that matters? Well, there's some easy pat answers to that. They're not pat, but you know. There's, there's, there's contests, there's pit orgies, there's all the, you know, these millions of things out there that you need to be careful about what you submit to. But there's all those ways, but there is no answer to the question. But the, and, and I got very, I, I, I really started, I had an ethical dilemma about it. I did not want to be trafficking in false hope and that I had some magical answer. So the first part of the answer is write a really great script. But the reason I was able to come back to teaching was the digital revolution. And the fact that you could make a movie, holding up my cell phone, ladies and gentlemen, you can make a movie on your cell phone now. You can make a movie for a thousand bucks. There is no excuse for you not to make a movie anymore. And knowing that, and knowing that I could go in and help people write a great screenplay, and that they, and if no one would give them the time of day, they could figure out how to write a great screenplay that they could shoot for $500 on their iPhone, inspired me to come back to teaching? And the answer is, there is no answer. The, the answer is you, you put yourself in every possible place, conceivable place you can think of without getting ripped off uh, by sham screenplay contests and all that. You put yourself in every conceivable place you can think of. You submit your script anywhere you possibly can. You talk to anyone who you think might be able to help you and maybe that door will open for you. But if none of that works, make your own movie. 
sorry, you know, I, I, and, 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 and I, and, and it's, 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 it's a great place to be, but it's a scary place for people to be. When I started in, in the business a, a, a billion years ago, making a movie was expensive. Just a film stock could stop you from making a movie. The cost of printing and developing and dailies and all of that could stop you from making a movie. That wasn't that people didn't do it, but it was incredibly difficult. But the digital revolution, if you can't get your stuff seen, if you can't get a pitch meeting, shoot a film. Shoot, 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 a, shoot a, a 10 minute short and post it on YouTube. Take your career and your life into your own hands and stop waiting for these gatekeepers to give you permission to be a filmmaker. And you can, at the same time, you're trying to get through that door and you're trying to get that pitch meeting and you're trying to get that huge movie off the ground. Do all of that, but be making your, your iPhone movie. Be, and, 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 and it's an answer that people don't want to hear. Why? Why do you think they don't want to hear it? Because, because it puts all the responsibility on them. It, 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 makes them. it makes them have to make a movie. It makes them have to do something in public and perhaps fail. Mm -hmm. It makes them have to go to their mother and say, can I have a thousand bucks, mom? Why? Well, I want to make a movie. If you think I'm going to spend a thousand dollars, I mean, you know, it's, it, it, it just puts all the responsibility back on you as, as, as a screenwriter and a filmmaker. And people hate that. They want that ticket that, that is going to open that door. And I wish I had an answer. I have struggled with that question for decades of teaching. Mm. And I don't know why these doors open for me. I don't know. I know I was persistent. I was idiotically persistent. I literally was that, that doofus who went around to, 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 to the guard gates at, at, at studios and said, I want to make a movie. How do I make a movie, sir? You know, to a, to a gate guard. I mean, I literally did that because I was so dumb. I didn't know any better. But one of them finally said to me, well, son, what do you, what do, you do? Well, I read. Well, then become a script reader. How do I do that? Well, ask someone. And I got a job $75 a week reading scripts. And it was... And then I got it, you know, and, and then I was like working, you know, at a cosmetic counter in a May company. And I, and I you know, I mean, it's just stupid stuff that that's the way life works or doesn't work for you. But the whole, the whole landscape has changed where anyone can make a movie now. What that means is there will be millions of bad movies, but make sure yours is a good one. And, you know, and, and... Oh God, here, build it and they will come or whatever that is. <laughs> so that's the uh -huh. best answer I can give. And it's not, I wish, uh, question, ans ask her, I could give you a better answer, but it's the only answer I can honestly give you because I don't know. I will, if contractually obliged to doing a beat sheet or an outline, I will do it. And sometimes you are. And what usually happens is you spend all this time on this beat sheet and this outline and it's the most bastardized thing in the world because it's not a script, it's not a story, it's kind of this thing that exists halfway between a script and a story. And I will, but I will do it if contractually obliged to. I'll do an outline and I'll do a very detailed outline and I'll do it always to the best of my abilities. I won't slum, but I'll do it and I'll hand it in. And the producers will go, we love this outline. This is a great outline. Now go write the script. And you'll go write the script and you'll have your outline. And you'll say, okay, here's what the outline is telling me. And you'll start writing and it will immediately start changing. And better ideas will emerge. And the next thing you know, the outline is completely out the window. And you've written a script and you'll turn it in. And the producers will go, we love this. This is just like the outline. And everyone's forgotten the outline. And, 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 and I don't, I know, again, my, my beat sheet is, I, obviously, you kind of know the beginning. You know, you're putting your characters and you feel these characters and you put them in this situation that they're going to have to fight for their lives to get out of. Uh, I kind of know what the end is going to be, kind of, sort of. And then it's the great unknown. 
And to do that in a beat sheet to me is just taking all the fun out of it. So don't, don't, don't listen to me. Listen to all the other people out there who say outline beat sheets. Please, if that's what you need to do. And there's great writers who do that. Of course they do that. But, and, and sometimes when you're collaborating, it becomes more necessary because you're sending stuff back and forth. But for me, I, I, they don't work for me. And, and anytime I do them, everything starts changing anyway so much that, the, that they quickly become irrelevant. Why don't they work for you? Because, I, because I, I, I'm, I'm a storyteller. And, and the stories emerge from someplace that, that, that is beat sheet proof. That's just me. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what, I mean, they, 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 just, they just come from somewhere else. And if I tell it all in a, in a, in a quote unquote beat sheet, it's like, it's like why, why would I do that to myself? Why, 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 would I, why, why would I take all the fun out of discovering it and put it in this thing that's just kind of bullet points? Uh, it just, it, but that's me, it, and and that's the idi idiosyncratic part of me. But I'm in good company. Stephen King, my favorite writer. Uh, ask him about beat sheets. Uh, uh, um, uh, there's, but but you know, uh, help me, the writer who wrote Game of Thrones, the books. George R. R. Martin. Thank you. He said it the best of anyone. He said there are, now, now you would think particularly if you've read the Game of Thrones books, that those things are outlined completely. They're so intricate, they're so full of plot and character and this needs to overlap and this needs to, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're extremely intricate stories. He doesn't outline. And what he says about it is, and I think it's such a great quote, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it's the essence of it. There are architects and there are gardeners. An architect will need that blueprint to build what it is they're going to build. He said, I'm a gardener. I plant a seed and I tend it and nurse it and I watch it grow. And there are architects who will do that beat sheet and will do it brilliantly, and, and I'm, so I'm not knocking it. And then there are gardeners, and I guess I'm a gardener. I just kind of let the idea sit there, and I tend it, and I, and I take good care of it, and make sure it gets all the water and sun, and then I watch it grow.